And hello, this is Conversations from the Alcove at the Lucille Lortel Theater. The Alcove is the new play development program at the Lortel. My name is Caridad Svich, and I'm the artistic director of the Alcove new play development program. And uh, I am beaming in from uh, the land of Lenape, uh, and I am wearing a, um, you won't? Uh, maybe you can't tell from there. It's sun and moon. It's a sun and moon top, navy background with pictures of the sun and moon on them uh, in yellow uh, against a white background. I'm fair skinned. I have auburnish hair. I'm wearing it to the side, longish. Um, I'm wearing tortoise uh, shell glasses, uh, slightly caddish in their vibe, uh, and a red headphones that are kind of stringy headphones, um, and red lipstick. <laughs> So I thought I'd mention that. Uh, and uh, on the other side of my screen, against our red background here, is uh, Dan O'Brien, the wonderful Dan O'Brien, an American playwright, poet, essayist, librettist. Um, their works include The Body of an American, uh, a play you might know, uh, the poetry collection, War Reporter. They've been awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship, uh, many other awards, including the Pen America Award in 2018 for The House in Scarsdale, a memoir for the stage, uh, an amazing, amazing playwright, educator, thinker on theater and all things arts related. Uh, the one thing I will say before I hand it over to Dan uh, briefly is to uh, say that this conversation series um, is looking chiefly at playwriting, but it's also just looking about how playwriting is positioned in the world. Uh, and what does it mean to be a, what does it mean to be a theater artist in these times? Yeah. Dan, hello, welcome. Hello, thank you. Thanks for, I'm on the other side of the screen and the other side of the country in Los Angeles. Um, and I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm, I'm wearing a, a navy blue shirt. I'm in a, I, I guess a mostly whitish, beige-ish, maybe overly beige room uh, <laughs> with mostly closed Venetian blinds behind me. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just so happy to be here and to, to talk about some of the things we're hopefully going to talk about. Very cool. Thanks for making time, Dan. So, so uh, I wanted to start, I want, I'm going to start with the heavy questions first, <laughs> and then maybe we'll get frivolous as it goes forward. But uh, I thought, why not? Uh, so, so this is a question I'm actually asking everyone because uh, uh, I feel like, how can I not? Uh, which is we are in climate yeah. change, right? We're in the climate era, as it's called, uh, the Capitalocene. Some people call it the Anthropocene. I call it the Capitalocene because it's capital mm -hmm. and extraction that has led us to this moment. Uh, mm -hmm. Wildfire, wildfire fires, interpandemic, floods, droughts, food scarcity, and uh, very little political will <laughs> yeah. to combat any of these things. Um, yeah. uh, so, so we're in this time of uh, opposing forces. Uh, just today, uh, when this airs, it won't be today, but just today I read um, uh, Shell, Shell, uh, an organization uh, devoted to the extraction of oil, uh, <laughs> uh, decided to continue it and to escalate mm -hmm. it until 2030, uh, mm -hmm. even though we know full well it's code red for the planet. So um, this is the world we're in, and we're also in the world of uh, a, the tide of far-right global fascism, uh, mm -hmm. and in its alignment with neoliberalism. So uh, mm -hmm. my question is, given all these things that we're living in, <laughs> oh my heaven, how do playwrights <laughs> respond? How do playwrights respond, both in terms of form and content and modes, as we are here, modes of artistic engagement and delivery? I mean, it, that, that's you've raised many related questions, I think, that are so pressing, obviously, right now. And I think a lot about them. I think, I mean, I find myself, I've been working on a play that has to do with gun violence and gun laws and thinking about a lot of the same issues in terms of this sense of denial in the culture. Um, you know, to what degree it, that's a psychological denial or if it's simply greed and a pursuit of, of you know, of making profits for certain people, um, it's uh, on a base level infuriating to me and to millions of people. 
when it's not depressing, when it doesn't induce despair, <laughs> it, it induces, uh, it inspires rage. I try to, you know, what, uh, what I try to do, you know, how can playwrights respond? I, I, I can only speak for myself and I, I'm sure um, I've done so imperfectly in the past and will do so, and, you know, do, will um, be imperfect in this way in the, in the future, but, you know, simply to try to address it through my work, you know, I, I've, I've, um, you know, any of us, of course, can can uh, protest and be activists in all kinds of ways that anybody can. Uh, but I always think about, well, what, you know, what talents or skills, for better or for worse, do I have? Uh, and that, you know, that that tends to be of the theatrical literary variety. Um, and I'm well aware that not many people in the grand scheme of things read poems or essays or see plays, you know, they're, they're, these are all um, genres of, of uh, communication that, that don't necessarily reach lots of people. And I think a lot about that because my wife is in TV and film, which maybe is a whole other subject, but it's a similar question of how do you make meaningful work in those genres when potentially millions of people are going to engage with the work, consume the work. Um, you know, from the beginning, I'm sure you felt this way too, but from the start of my so-called career, I felt like the theater and poetry, um, at least you had more freedom from market pressure, market pressures to create uh, because there was much less money involved for everybody. I mean, that's a kind of glib thing to say because of course some people are making money. Many producers and theaters, there are people that are able to extract uh, from the art form, uh, a middle-class life, whereas playwrights um, for, for, for certain, um, you know, are not paid n nearly uh, anything like a living wage and uh, uh, to say nothing of what poets, poets make. Um, but, you know, it always just turns me back to the work. The play I've been writing about uh, gun violence and gun control it, it started with, with, I mean, it is about Newtown, about the Sandy Hook um, shooting in 2012. And at the time, like many people, I was of course horrified and, and full of despair and, and also infuriated. Um, and the thought was, well, I have to try to write something in response to it, uh, you know, again, just for myself, not knowing if anybody would want to see it or produce it. Um, and, uh, then life got in the way. My wife and I were both diagnosed with cancer and went through about a year and a half of cancer treatment, which we think is related to some environmental causes. So you talk about living through a time, this this sort of you know late stage capitalism, with all, all the deleterious effects of that. You know, obviously um, it's not just COVID. It's it's I think the rising rates of cancer and all kinds of um, challenges to our health. Um, so when I came back to the play with Newtown, uh, it was it was when, uh, you know, there were some more high profile school shootings, uh, Parkland, the Parkland shooting in 2017, I believe, um, was what, um, you know, really got me moving on the play. Uh, and that sense, again, of just just just, uh, you know, anger that that. Um, so many people are willing to live in denial of something so destructive to so many people um, and wanting to use the art to, to, to um, at least give expression to, to that outrage. Uh, and, and two, I hope, I mean, maybe this sounds naive, maybe at my age I shouldn't be naive, but I do think a play can change things, can change people's opinions, even if it's in a subtle way, um, even if it's part of a larger movement in the culture. So, yeah, it always turns me back to my work, you know, that sense that uh, this is what I can do. Uh, you know, I, I have doubts like any artist about how well I do it, uh, but this is what I've done for 25 years. And, and, and in many ways, I feel privileged and lucky that my job uh, is something that can address these issues. You know, I think uh, obviously many people are, are in careers and professions uh, where they can't necessarily use their work to engage head on with some of some of these issues. But it's been interesting so far, even with a Newtown play, which will have a premiere next season um, at Jiva Theater Center. But it's been an interesting ride so far in terms of uh, even with theater people, dramaturgs, producers, 
prospective producers, um, the resist a resistance to um, looking at the issue too straight on, too head on, in in too sort of honest or frank or forthright a manner. Um, you know, I, I I just that feels central to how I think about writing in general. Like if there's something that's taboo that I feel like should not be <laughs> taboo, uh, I'm going to want to write about it. Yeah, yeah. I think that that makes me think a lot about um, <sighs> toxic positivity, right? So right. that we have, I think it's escalated, you know, or maybe I just never noticed it as much before, but I feel yeah. like in our industry uh, for a variety of reasons, I mean, I, I think there's also fear of, uh, at a time of great precarity of fear of losing the audience, right? Yeah. Uh, but, um, but, there's this kind of a toxic positive and it's coming top down. It's also in our politics and, and in so yeah. many things, but you know, theater is a microcosm of all of these things. Um, yeah. And um, uh, a desire to escape. And, and, and I think that escape has a place, obviously, you know, it's necessary, it's good for the spirit, all those things. Yeah. But I, but I, you know, I jokingly say to a lot of my friends, you know, I say, but the ho our whole society is escaping all the time. Right. right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Like, I feel like there has to be some place where we're not escaping, <laughs> where we're actually right. confronting, where we're actually encountering at the very least something, you know? Well, and, I think, um, yeah. yeah. And I think that, I think you and I, you know, probably overlap a lot in terms of the, the type of theater that means a lot to us and meant a lot to us in our more formative years. Yeah. And so my, my conception of the theater as a young playwright you know, was as a place where you could ask those questions that the more commercial arts were not allowed to, you know? Um, and of course, growing up and maturing in the field, you start to realize, yeah, the theater is is subject to many, if not the same market pressures, um, you know, to sell tickets and to entertain and to appear uh, on trend and on point and all kinds of things. Uh, but I still feel maybe it's too hardwired in me. I still feel like the, the theater I want to see and want to create is a theater that that, that is uh, confronting the audience by confronting the the artist first. Do you know what I mean? I, I don't. I don't. I don't think that I ever want. I don't want to come at the audience from a place of um, sanctimony or uh, you know like I have some sort of answer to these incredibly complex questions. You know, I, I just, I related to my childhood, one one that was, um, I consider emotionally and uh, verbally abusive, and also childhood full of secrets and lies and a pressure to not, simply to not speak the truth about what was really going on in my family, you know? And writing as a child, I, I truly, it's it's an easy thing to say, but I truly feel like it saved me because it allowed me to say those things, to put into to words and also to make those words meaningful, maybe sometimes aesthetically uh, pleasing, at least to me, you know, to sort of salvage something uh, from uh, the struggle, the wreckage, you know. Um, so the theater for me was was way in an even more intense way to speak the truth because it happens in public. It happens live. It happens, you know, with um, with people next to you, you know, in a dark room. Um, yeah. So toxic, I mean, you, you mentioned toxic positivity. And of course, that's that's a word that comes up a lot with cancer treatment and cancer survivorship, too. Yeah. Uh, you know, so my wife and I have, have dealt with that and thought a lot about that as well. And I think it's, you know, when COVID first, um, you know, happened, uh, I was, I wrote a few things, I published a few things about sort of trying to relate the cancer experience to the COVID experience, mm -hmm. sort of the personal cancer experience to the, what I thought was maybe a larger cultural experience, you know, and, and there were many parallels, I think, uh, and many differences, but, but yeah, one is this idea of toxic positivity, and also this idea that now so many people want are acting as if the culture's in remission from COVID. 
or, or, or like it never happened, as you said, yes. um, which is something that happens with a lot of people who've had cancer treatment and they're, they're cancer free, as they say, after treatment and may never develop cancer again. Uh, and it's their right, I suppose, you know, on an individual level to say that's in the past, that never happened. COVID's different because it hasn't disappeared. And so it's, it's uh, again, it's intriguing to me when it's not infuriating or depressing, uh, you know, what's happening on a cultural level in terms of making it disappear, um, you know, and just even, you know, we're writers. So just hearing it spoken of in the past tense so often yeah. is so fascinating to me, you know, just when that happened, the, the creeping quality of how that happened, uh, I traveled a little bit during COVID, so comparing different, you know, the, the trajectory or progression of how people thought about the disease in different parts of the country, and even I uh, spent a little time in the UK in 2021, mm -hmm. and that was very different. I was in London, and it was very different than Los Angeles, West Side Los Angeles, where everybody was still masked up, you know, outside on the street. And London in fall of 2021, they had kind of decided it was over, <laughs> which was such a shock uh, yeah. to me. And But now it seems like probably anywhere you go in the U.S., it seems like most people have decided it's over. Yeah, the hubris of that is uh, astonishing. And also, I think it's, it's of course, uh, uh, the business plan, right? So the, the, right. the federal business plan <laughs> yeah. uh, that that has decided uh, has has created this sort of socially engineered reality, um, yeah. which which um, of course you know a is I mean again I'm going to use the word hubris again because I do think it's a tragedy um, and I think that it's also we don't know it is a novel virus so we don't know. <laughs> We actually don't know how it's how many mutations it's going to have, like yeah. what it's a trajectory, you know. So I think that the this act of disappearance, which you know, makes me think of like other kinds of political disappearances that have happened, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of my family uh, went through not out of their choice, but you know, situations in their lives where there was, you know, let's say in Argentina, the dirty wars, you know, mm -hmm. in um, during Franco's regime, how people were disappeared, you know, so, uh, so this notion of suddenly creating a reality where, well, that's gone, you will all agree to this now. And I'm like, yeah. but where are those people? Like, you know, where are the, you know, and I think right. that the, for me, it, a lot of it has to do with, I think in the US context, although I know this is happening also in other countries, but in the US context, um, the US, I joke about this with my writing students sometimes when I'm not angry, but, but one of the things I, I, I often say is like, we're a country of many problems. One of them is that we have collective amnesia about mm -hmm. our past, right? About our, right. even our, even the founding in quotation marks. Right. Yeah. So, so, and that's part of the, the forward march kind of quality of the country, right? That's sort of mm -hmm. what it does well in a weird way. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll just trample over everything, <laughs> Keep, you know? But what happens with that yeah. is that the trauma keeps building, right? So it's like trauma upon right. trauma upon trauma. So, so this shallow, shallow mountain, you know, and under it is, you know, the Native mm -hmm. American genocide. And, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. it's just like exponential, right? And um, uh, the legacies of slavery that that we're still dealing with and will, because it's never really been confronted head on, it mm -hmm. continues to not be dealt with really. And so you get situations like the one we're in now with kind of rise of a, of a overtly fascist, although fascism mm -hmm. has been in the US for a long time, right? So, mm -hmm. um, so I think that this, this collective amnesia is a sickness of sorts, yeah. um, you know, because, and I think that as writers, you know, one of the things that I, in my joking and non-joking way with students, what I say is our job is to record. Mm -hmm. Our job is to really look and to really observe and to record. And, and that can be in any mode you wish, like the style of it, 
the tone and style in which you write is another question, but mm -hmm. that one of our duties amongst many listening to ourselves and being true and all those things is also like, what do I see? What's, what's not being told? What is, mm -hmm. you know, and I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm all like, write it all down, you know, cause this is happening mm -hmm. in real time. <laughs> yeah. And I think that if, and, and I think that, um, you know, there's a, like, if you don't write it, I think it will be disappeared. Yeah. In other words. Yeah. No, I agree. I, I think, you know, when I, you mentioned uh, this play I wrote called The Body of an American. Yeah. And one of the impulses, the first impulse is to write the play. It's about a war reporter, a, a, a real guy who's now my friend. His name is Paul Watson. And he, he just for listeners, he took a photo that won the Pulitzer Prize in the 90s, in 1993, during the Battle of Mogadishu, of a fallen U.S. Army Ranger, uh, who was deceased and was being desecrated by a group um, of Somalians in the streets of Mogadishu. And, uh, you know, his story on its own was compelling to me in lots of ways, but one uh, foundational uh, reason why I wanted to write about him was because I felt like at that time in the late uh, aughts, there was amnesia about the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. I mean, it, this, and, and Paul was covering those wars at that time. And uh, it reminded me of an earlier event, which was the Battle of Mogadishu, that people to some degree, I mean, that was an interesting event uh, in the sense that that caused that picture that he took, you talk about recording what you're seeing, you know, that picture that he took actually, you know, so often we can record something truthfully or honestly or realistically and it gets shoved down into the denial hole collectively or personally. That photo of his got out to the world, you know, and was on the cover of magazines and newspapers everywhere for all kinds of reasons. It was beyond. It was bit much bigger than him. He didn't even know the picture was out there. He, he was he was then in Rwanda covering the genocide, and this is pre digital, so he had had the film sort of smuggled out of the country, and it was another war reporter weeks later who said, "Are you are you aware?" of what this photograph is, is doing, you know, to the world. Uh, and it was, so it had a great, uh, I don't mean great, a, a large result, a, a momentous result in that it caused the US to um, withdraw from Somalia, uh, but also to disengage from uh, tracking and keeping tabs on what was happening with Al Qaeda, which was kind of a nascent organization also in Somalia at the time. Anyway, it was just interesting to me that his story, that, that that photo that he took, which is a very disturbing photo, but it was really what was happening on the ground, um, that that photo was also, it had its, its moment, it had an effect, and it also kind of just disappeared. You know, there didn't seem to be any sort of lesson learned from it. Um, Paul says to this day, the reason he took that photo, and he's been racked with guilt about it for decades, but he, 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 the, the one reason I think is quite um, uh, justifiable for why he took the photo was that the Pentagon was lying about the degree of involvement of, of U.S. Um, armed forces in, in Mogadishu and was lying specifically about previous events where helicopters, Black Hawk helicopters had been shot down and other uh, pilots and soldiers had been um, desecrated. So he was just moving for working from a place of they're lying about what's happening. By extension, they're lying about my work because I'm there, I'm seeing it happen. So I'm going to, you know, he was much younger and full of reckless bravado, but he said, I'm gonna, you know, put myself in harm's way to record the truth. And I think that's what in a in a much more watered down way, <laughs> because I've never I'm not a war reporter or anything, but I feel like that's that's our job too as artists, right? And it's not just to tell the truth about sort of easy things or things that are not um, that are not taboo. It's to tell the truth about things that are complicated, painful, disturbing, uh, unjust, um, and and to, and to make of it a compelling story. You know, a story that not only will involve people's emotions, but again, maybe shift something in terms of how they think about themselves and how they want to live their life, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah, absolutely. 
how did you come to uh, uh, the terrain of documentary that a lot of your work, your playwriting in particular yeah. is involved in, which I'm, I don't, I'm trying to think, I mean, I know there are other writers that work in this terrain, but I think your approach is quite unusual. And so I just, I, and I know yeah. there are probably people out there that don't know about this, so, or might not know about it. So yeah, can sure. you walk us through what led to this? Yeah, you know, when I, when I was first writing plays, um, I probably was coming at it from a more conventional place of uh, fictional plays inspired by my life, maybe drawn from my life. They were still autobiographical the way probably anybody's play or novel or what have you is. Um, within that world, I, I did write a lot of historical plays. And when the shift happened in me about 10 or 15 years ago towards documentary um, biography and autobiography of living people, autobiography obviously of a living person, um, <laughs> it seemed to me in some ways like I was just bringing my interest in hi historical plays into the present. Do you know what I mean? That yeah. another way to think about it is that maybe a history play is a documentary play, except everybody's dead. And <laughs> you can, and maybe that gives you more, more poetic license and more freedom to, to make of it the story as, as you, as you, um, uh, to suit your, your needs, your artistic needs. But about, yeah, about 10 or 15 years ago, um, I, I grew tired of that and I tie it to um, freeing myself, being freed from my family, my, my birth family. So, um, you know, at the ripe old age of 33, 32, not to be too on the nose, but kind of my, my Jesus year, um, my family, things that had been wrong and, and uh, abusive and uh, toxic in my family kind of came to a head. And um, I was essentially disowned um, by my parents, um, by extension from most of my siblings. I'm one of six, um, six kids, a big Irish American family in the suburbs of New York. And, uh, you know, it was traumatic, but also liberating. Um, but it caused a real shift in terms of the stories or how I want the stories I wanted to write and how I wanted to write them. And I felt I, it, this is just for me. This isn't a statement about other the way people should write. Do you know what I mean? I feel like sometimes mm -hmm. when I talk about this, it can sound like this. But for me, I felt like, oh, the fictional plays were, were, were a displacement of the truth. They were a mask. They were an evasion uh, to some degree for me. And so for my artistic, psychological, spiritual development, I, I needed to speak uh, plainly and, and honestly. Um, and part of that also had to do with what I want to write about, you know, so, so, you know, the, that play with Paul Watson really was the first play that I wrote that it, that is a blend of memoir and um, documentary because I'm a character in the play. And to some degree, my, the story of my family is a, is a minor story in Paul's story sort of threaded through. Um, and, and since then, I, yeah, I've, I've continued on that, uh, path and only recently have I flirted a little bit with writing plays that are more fictional in nature and I don't know if it'll take I continue to I continue to want to tell tell true stories uh aware of course you know I mean what's fascinating to me about the whole concept and I'm actually writing a lecture right now I teach quite often at the Sewanee Writers Conference so I'm writing a lecture for this summer's conference about the the idea of a true story you know um and, you know, of course, the idea, you know, the break that happened in my family between my parents and me, um, we, we have different ideas of the truth in that conflict, obviously, you know, so I, I don't, I, I think there's a difference between this idea of what's true about a story or a situation, and when are you as an artist doing what you can to be as honest or faithful or searching or forthcoming as you can be. Um, so, you know, that continues to be what's interesting to me. I even felt like, um, you know, cause a lot of these plays are derived from uh, recordings, audio or video recordings 
of either Paul Watson's time in war zones or, or his time with me together, you know, for, for many years, anytime we saw each other, I would just start recording and he knew I was recording and uh, he, he, it was kind of, I was very lucky in that he has a personality that was completely uh, open to that sort of collaboration. Um, that said, he's never, he's never, I was also lucky in that he's never read, read or seen my work. So he is very happy to, um, uh, you know, to reveal himself to me, and, but to let me make of it whatever I think is, is, um, is right, you know, artistically. But I had started to develop a real just love of, um, you know, sort of mining the raw material of the way we speak and the way we behave for those revealing words and phrases and moments. And, and it's a time consuming process. I mean, this is part of this lecture I'm writing too. You know, often that's a lot of transcripts to go through and a lot of recordings to pour through. Um, but I really developed uh, a love of that approach. You know, I'm sure it's I'm sure it's very similar to to documentary filmmakers. You know, you record hours and hours and years and years of of, of uh, a relationship with a subject before you arrive at what what you hope is a compelling story. Um, you know, in in two hours or what have you. Um, but I yeah, I really I really. Um, I'm still in that place, I, I suppose. The, the play about New, Newtown, I mean, this, this is a somewhat a step away from documentary because I couldn't, um, the people, the characters I wanted to write about, I, I, I didn't have access to. Uh, but at the same time, I wanted the play to not, I didn't want to let myself off the hook, if that makes sense, in writing uh, a fictionalized version of that story. Um, and again, that's not to say that other people can't and shouldn't write that way, but for me, it was important to say, no, let's look at what really happened as close, as honestly as we can, as off-putting as, and terrifying as it might be, and try to find some meaning in it, you know, and try to find, uh, without being reductive or glib or, um, even overtly ideological, let's try to find a way through it. You know, I always think of that, that overused quote uh, from the poet Yeats, you know, that idea that argument with, I'm paraphrasing, I'm sure, argument with oneself is, is, is art versus argument with others is rhetoric. Right. And, um, you know, I think the theater can do something kind of in between those two. I think I think poetry often is uh, argument with oneself. It can still be political. It can still have a lot to say politically. Um, but and I think argument and I think you know argument with others as theater maybe it edges closer to something like agitprop theater. Um, you know, more sort of self avowedly political theater. Um, mm -hmm. But I think there's a way. Yeah, I just want to write plays where the characters are are complex and and full-bodied and, and uh, full of contradictions, um, but that still that still might you know move the argument forward on a certain issue or topic. Yeah, yeah. The uh, I was thinking I've been thinking a lot about uh, auto fiction. You know, mm. uh, yeah. and its rise, or I mean, it's been around, it, it called different things, but it's been around right. for, for a very long time. Right. But right now, it's called auto fiction, uh, yeah. and um, and I feel like theater. I'm thinking of pieces like well, this is slightly different, but Dana H. Lucas Nath's play, mm -hmm. or uh, is this a room? Right. The, Mm -hmm. Tina Satter's staging of a redacted transcript. <laughs> um, uh, as they're not, those two pieces aren't aren't auto fiction, but certainly Dana H has this mutable relationship 
to mm -hmm. what we may, we are hearing a recording. If people don't know Dana Age, it's a, mm -hmm. I'll do a very brief summary of what you might see when you go see it on stage. Usually it's a, uh, there's a recording of the real woman, uh, uh, Lucas's mom, um, who had an extremely traumatic, uh, violent, uh, experience uh, happened to her. Uh, I won't give it away uh, for those of you that don't know it. Um, and uh, recordings happen. So the, the son and, and um, Steve Cosson, mm -hmm. who is a nursing director and a director, uh, did interviews mm -hmm. with her. So what we hear are, of course, edited uh, right. recordings, um, lip synced by an actor, right? In this case, mm -hmm. the brilliant uh, Didi O'Connell. Um, so, but that's but that piece, interestingly, in the recordings, we start to hear how how the truth shifts, how like sometimes timelines don't kind mm -hmm. of line up. And I remember as an audience member going, yeah. "Wait a minute, what? Um, wait, but didn't didn't she just say? But hold on, like, and trying to right. actually find what really, you know, not what really happened, but more like I became obsessed with the timeline." <laughs> that play, I was like, I was all like, because they're also like, obviously it's intentional, but uh, there are these right. gaps in the play where it's like, I didn't speak to my son for so many years. And I was like, what? What happened? And it was right. like, there was this one phone call, but that son never tried to reach out. You know, there was, I just started to have all these questions around. So I, I'm saying yeah. this because I think there's this space for the audience when they're in the presence of work that is factual, but also factual fictional right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, or how is it playing with truth or not that i think is a fascinating space for an audience to be in and, I, and our right. job of course as dramatists is to engage with an audience uh, so so i guess yeah. i guess i wonder how do you think about the audience uh when you make your plays and and what, yeah. what do you expect that relationship to be you know when when the body of american was first produced or maybe i think it was its second production the producer wanted to refer to it as verbatim theater. And because so much of it was derived from audio and video recordings. Um, and I think I may have even let them do that because I felt like maybe, maybe it was close enough. Do you know what I mean? Um, right. Because I, you know, it's not only like you just said about Dana H, it's not only the question of what do you leave out, um, which is a huge factor in terms of, fictionalizing i mean you're you're changing the story to some degree you're shaping the story uh you're you're affecting how potentially an audience um, is going to engage with it and follow the story um but then even then there were of course smaller um elements that i did fictionalize um because i it's it's hard to talk about in any way that feels very defensible or <laughs> or scientific, it, it felt very intuitive. It felt like okay, this is a this is a little bit of poetic license, and it's true to enough for me to w the essence of what the story is and what I'm trying to communicate. But you know, for me, it still felt like it was like five percent of the story was kind of it was the the edges were being sanded off or, or, or molded into something a bit more f uh, fictional. Um, and with that play, The Body of an American, I felt very lucky that, you know, there's something, I didn't feel like I had to change that much. Like so many w strange things happened in um, my relationship with Paul, things that happened to do with timing of creative, of writing it in, and uh, discovering things about his life and my life. So, you know, things with that play really fell into place in a way that sometimes with other plays um, that hasn't happened. And, and I've written other documentary plays that have, that have not, that have never finished because many of these things have never, haven't lined up and worked out and, the, the, and months uh, of work have kind of fizzled out or turned into ashes or whatever. And again, that's part of, I think, the documentary um, challenge. You know, you just have to be open. If you're, if you're being truthful to life, you have to be willing to, to, to be disappointed because you're not controlling as much. You're not controlling as much of the story, you know. Um, but you were asking about sort of like how much I think about the audience. I don't, you know, maybe having 10 or 15 years, 10 years of being a playwright before I started trying to write uh, documentary style plays 
maybe that meant that there, that I just had some dramaturgical notions and impulses that were just kind of there as a framework, you know? Um, and uh, so I was still conscious of um, telling a story to an audience. It's always, of course, at first that imagined audience that's probably just you, yourself, you know, and imagining watching this play. And um, and then of course, once you start having readings and workshops and, you know, the, you're reminded of course, of how many different points of view are gonna be sitting in that audience and how one person will be enthralled and somebody else will be uh, snoozing, you know. Um, so, but yeah, I'm, I'm always feeling without, without, you know, getting self-conscious about it or getting into a place of fear, you know, I'm always thinking, what is this communicating in the moment in time? Because again, you know, theater, uh, dramatic writing is so much about time, about the present tense, you know, and about obviously good writing in general has an economy of word choice and action and structure and all, all that sort of thing. But I think the theater and probably film and TV, but the theater, uh, you, you, you're so, the audience is so contained and they know it and they feel it. And I, I always, I do always feel an exciting pressure to, um, you know, to keep the story surprising and moving forward. And again, the story as I understand it, you know, my, my sense of what, what is moving forward in a story may not be somebody else's idea, you know, and that happens all the time too. Um, so, I don't know. I mean, yeah, again, not to, I feel like I keep going back to the body of an American, but I think, um, you know, it's, it's pretty true to how I've been writing since, you know, I, I, I wanted the audience to, to, to be carried along with a story, with a sort of the a sense of a narrative while at the same time wanting to, um, sort of evoke Paul Watson's, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder as part of the experience. So this, so I wanted the play to feel at times out of control, shattered, um, maybe even confusing to a degree. Um, so I, you know, I wasn't, I, I didn't want it to be sort of a conventional um, straight ahead story that the audience could sit back in their chairs and enjoy. I wanted them to sit forward and have some of the questions that, 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 that sort of like what you were saying, your experience of Dana H, you know, that sense of, um, uh, yeah, creating intriguing questions for the audience, you know. And again, that goes back to that idea of the theater, a, a good play being a problem, being a challenge. Yeah. Uh, obviously, if it's too challenging or problematic, any audience member, including myself, can sit back and throw up their hands and say, I don't get this. It's not working hard enough to reach me. I can't, you know, of course that can happen. Uh, but there's there's a, there's a sort of an imagined uh, place where, you know, you, you can engage the audience uh, and involve them. I mean, that's the other thing, right? I mean, I think about this a lot, again, with my wife's TV and film career. So much TV and film, you know, is obviously much more about entertainment. It's much more about sitting back and letting the, you know, consuming the experience of, of some uh, escapist entertainment, uh, which again, I also value, you know, um, I watched so much TV and film during cancer treatment. And I'll tell you the truth, most of it was pretty escapist fair because <laughs> my, my quote unquote real life at the time, I wanted to escape from, you know, I yeah. wanted to be someplace, um, happier you know and or at least just different enough from from my life sort of more fantastical perhaps um so again i'm not denigrating that approach uh, at all but uh the yeah that the art you know that i want to create um you know is art that asks the audience when they're in the mood for it when they've been forewarned um to to enter into this question, hopefully an important question. Like I hope when people see the Newtown play, um, you know, they're ready for it. They're not, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're up for it. Um, and they're, they're willing to ask some of the questions that it's asking, you know. Somebody, a, a dramaturg recently wrote to me and said, uh, he, thought, he thought it was just too, he said it was, he thought it was un, unstageable because it was just too dark. 
Um, and uh, bleak, I think was the word he used. And I respect that point of view. I mean, I think for many people it, it will be. Um, but, you know, what's bleak for me is my daughter having to hide under her desk for 50 minutes. This happened two weeks ago. She's nine years old. The whole class, they all had to turn out the lights and lock the door and cover the door so no light could get in. They had to sit under the desk for 50 minutes and go through a drill, um, you know, imagining there was a, a shooter with automatic weapons of war prowling through their school. That's effing bleak. And that's happening in every school across the country. And this dramaturg, you know, friend lives in the UK. <laughs> and I'm not surprised that maybe this is too bleak for him, you know, and, and it may be too bleak for American audiences too to see a play like this. But my impulse is still to say, look, it's happening. It's, it's, it's unacceptable. It's unconscionable. You know, we have to do something. I can't do much, but I can write a play. And hopefully the actors and designers and artists that, that engage with that play will, will feel similarly like, okay, you know, this is what we can do. And uh, yeah, so I don't know how I went off on that, that tangent exactly, but. <laughs> no, it's all, it's uh, understandable. And I also think that um, it's interesting what you bring up in terms of what can read as bleak in one culture and not in another. And, yeah. you know, that also has to do with an audience, um, you yeah. know, and. And, uh, and, at, and at what time? I think it's really interesting yes. what you were saying earlier. You know, we are in this time where it seems like there's this cultural trend towards toxic positivity, or I think you have used, you've used the word hopium, right? Sort hopium, of this. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and it, it's, it's really interesting because so much work I'm sure was created during the beginning of the pandemic yeah. that was and, and you know recording things that i guess somebody could see as quite bleak do you know what i mean and yeah. it's interesting to think is there a place for that work now some of that work has already been published and produced and you know but it's an interesting question how much of that work will be lost resurface in five years yeah um because i don't you know i don't scientifically keep tabs on theater seasons and what's being produced but you know it does seem like for lots of reasons there's a lot more broad entertaining fare being offered with the occasional challenging work slipped in yeah, um, yeah. almost by accident you know i almost think it's like the sneaky approach right we'll give yeah. you one <laughs> And then we'll right, surround right. it with all these other, I, but, but I will say what I find fascinating, we're almost wrapping up here, but uh, what I find yeah. fascinating is that, you know, I was thinking about this in relationship uh, to 9-11, right? So, mm -hmm. and at the time, everybody was like, it's too soon to write about 9-11. We have right. to wait right. 10 years to write about. And then I kept waiting. <laughs> I was right. like, okay. I mean, I know a lot of plays did get written at that time, and they were sort of rapid response theater, you know, uh, Anne Nelson's mm -hmm. The Guys, and, you know, there were others. Um, uh, yeah, re recent tragic events, wasn't recent that the first Recent tragic events, one? absolutely. Yeah. yeah, recent tragic events. And so and so then I thought, well, but now t when the 10 years had happened, I was like, okay, mm -hmm. I'm ready, <laughs> right? <laughs> like the, everybody in, you know, in all American theater are now going to stage, not only that, but like, plays about the Iraq war and Afghanistan, yeah. the, one of the longest wars we've been involved in, you know, yeah. and it was like, felt like crickets, you know, it just felt like, like that was sort of like, it went away, you know? And and then of course you have generation yeah. that has no awareness of 911, like they weren't alive then, right? You know, so to them, it's like, I don't know, something that happened, right. <laughs> um, right. you know? And so I'm like, oh no, like, with well, isn't it, isn't it the same impulse where we're after the, the the latest mass shooting? There's the yes. response among some, well, we don't talk about the politics now. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, we'll talk about it some future date. Correct. And then the, the shootings keep happening. There, it's a continual uh, yes. trauma that yes. the culture is living through. We now know. I know people that have lived through mass shootings in yes. public places, and and uh, you know, it's it's and it, it just as you were saying earlier, it just goes underground or becomes part of the sort of malignant fabric of the culture yeah. and erupts and, and manifests as more violence in some fashion. 
Correct. You know. Yeah. Um, no, it is. It reminds me. Yeah, exactly of, of what happened after nine. I there was even an editor, uh, for a newspaper a magazine that published an essay of mine. But he, he he at the time of COVID starting, he he tweeted something about like how he was going to do everything in his power to like not publish things about COVID, <laughs> and and I think it was just this impulse of of like just not wanting to, um, uh, I don't know, and I'm not sure exactly, like maybe it was all denial, maybe it was just a feeling that in months it would blow over and he didn't want it to seem like they had overreacted in some way. But I think on some deep level that response is simply denial and fear. Yeah. yeah. You know, because yeah. it's 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 too, um it's too scary just to so many people I, I i feel this when i write about cancer too you know yeah. it's it's something that for good reason is quite frightening to people uh it doesn't mean that it shouldn't be talked about or, or written about um because i believe i think obviously that leads to um to less shame or information better you know better choices in your life you know in all mm -hmm. kinds of ways probably it leads to less cancer you know um, yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I, you know, I, even I felt that, I, I felt that right after 9-11. My wife and I, I mean, we, we still wondered to what degree 9-11 may have influenced our developing cancer because uh, we lived near the World Trade Center oh. and her apartment had been covered in dust and every, she lived there, but I kind of, I spent, you know, most, most of my time at her apartment. And uh, I, rem and so, like for many millions of people, it felt like a very personal event mm -hmm. when it, when it happened. And I also felt, I remember when the first few plays about 9-11 were popping up, I did have some of that impulse of like, oh, this is too soon. Or or are these people like cashing in on this trauma in some way? And and it's my trauma. How can they write about it? <laughs> you know, if they live somewhere else, you know. Yeah. And uh, so, but I'm sure some of that was an impulse to, to deny something I was feeling, you know? And I actually only have written about it in The Body of an American, which I wrote, you know, 10 years later. Right. So for me, it took that long to, to sort of um, work its way out of me, you know? So I'm very, I feel like I'm very sympathetic to many of these impulses we're talking about, you know, the, the desire to escape um, or to deny certain things but it's just so it's such a core value for me um, at the theater as we said at the beginning is the place where you you have to ask the important questions the disturbing questions the difficult questions like that that to me just that was the genre of writing and art in in which you could best do that you know um so we continue to do it. We, it's a different question, you know, what the marketplace is, is, is uh, looking for at any given time. Yeah. Um, but, but that's the theater I, I value the most. Yeah, the, uh, the being in the presence of what we need to witness or what has not been witnessed yet or what has been refused witnessing, you know, yeah. is a space for theater. And I think that, um, in whatever iteration it takes, you know, I'm as fond of audio drama as I am of like, you know, digital drama, et cetera. You know, yes. there are many, the, the, I think the yeah. medium is the medium and you do play with it as you will. But I think yeah. that this notion of witnessing, which is so central to the event making of theater um, mm -hmm. um, is what, what gives it its power. And also why, you know, I was thinking a little bit about those old, old plays, you know, Oedipus and, <laughs> and, um, yeah. old plays very old plays and why they still weirdly hold up and um and, and no matter what's how they're interpreted and you know like and and thinking but not not for their canonicalness so that so i will say it's not really for me about that but more about that they're ferocious mm -hmm. about just asking for that encounter to take place yeah and for the witnessing to happen yeah. Um, and, yeah. and there's a, 
it's very brave, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like in, in, in a society um, and in societies that, um, I was thinking a lot about this the other night, in a societies that are basically running on lies and fumes, <laughs> Um, you know, theater might be the one place where we can actually hear the truth. Um, so, and and I think the, the advantage of theater is that this is going to sound cheeky, but I don't mean it to be. Which is, um, in a weird way, we're so marginal mm -hmm. <laughs> that, in a way, nobody cares about what we're doing. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, we're like making plays and people are like, I don't know, what is yeah. that? You know, so I feel like in a way there's license to actually create those spaces of witnessing even more because we're, I mean, we're, I, we're, we're hiding. I, we're in the wilderness, tell we're myself, really in the wilderness Dan. That's true, we are, we are. I had two thoughts about that. One was, so when I've written, one of my plays is a memoir play. And so when I've written about my family and some of my family has been quite upset about it, one reaction I have, is that well it's a play or, or these are poems like not many people are going to see this or read this so let's everybody calm down you know um it's not like they, there's a billboard on sunset avenue you know um and then my my other thought uh you know in, in regard to what you were saying is um you know the theater or maybe poetry too reminds me of what they say about like bands like the velvet underground you know that they that a hundred people bought their record, but each of those people started their own band or something, you know? Mm -hmm. So maybe if it, if a play doesn't reach many people in terms of numbers, sheer numbers, um, maybe it can still have an influence in terms of the people that are compelled to be in the audience at the at the theater. Because hopefully, ideally, if they're coming to see uh, plays like the sort, sorts of plays that, that we care about, um, they're people that feel similarly, that this is a place for a vital, perhaps brutal encounter <laughs> with the truth, you know, uh, something both profane and holy can happen, you know, when you're dealing with an attempt at naked honesty and truth. I mean, these are all words that are coming out of me because you, you've mentioned the Greeks, and and I yeah. think uh, those plays that 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 have survived and continue to affect people that they, they they are brutal and beautiful and immediate and naked um, and confront the audience and engage the audience directly, you know? So if we could, if we could all be the velvet underground, I think that's, that's my takeaway. That's my ambition. No, not, not a bad ambition. Uh, I yeah. want to thank you so much for your time today, oh, thank Dan. You. Of uh, course. For anyone that's out there when this goes live, when we are live, we are live now. I'll pretend we are live now okay, uh, okay. because we are in a way. Um, that we're in simultaneous time, as I call it. Mm -hmm. um, thanks for watching. Uh, if you catch us on the back end or on the front end of this, um, read Dan's plays, read his poetry, read his beautiful books, um, uh, as well as see them when they're on stages near you. Uh, I will hit the end record button, but I'll stay on for the to say some goodbyes, Dan. But for you guys out there, bye and see you later. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This was a, a joy.